Tonight, we are so pleased to welcome Stephen Brill to discuss Tailspin, in which he examines the ways that America's biggest institutions have shifted in the past 50 years, from serving the many to serving the few, or, in some cases, serving no one at all. I don't really need to give you examples of this. We have examples on Pennsylvania Avenue, we have them on K Street, we have them on Wall Street. But Brill, who is an award-winning journalist and the author of America's Bitter Pill, in which he gives the tailspin treatment to our broken health care system, takes on here our broken financial culture and our broken political culture, and he does show us some people and organizations to look at to model a new and brighter future which we need to hear about. So please join me to welcome him to Politics and Prose. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the book, but I'm really looking forward to taking all your questions as well. Um, This book, at its core, tries to answer a question that most of us, regardless of our political leanings, have been asking ourselves some version of for the last few years. How did we get here? How did the world's greatest democracy and economy become a land of crumbling roads, galloping income inequality, bitter polarization, and dysfunctional government? Now here's the version of that question that I posed to myself about uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, My wife, uh, Cynthia, uh, who's here tonight, and I, uh, my wife, uh, Cynthia, and I um, had just arrived at Kennedy Airport from abroad. Uh, We trudged through the crowded, ugly terminal at Kennedy. Uh, We got into a cab, and then we were stuck on what's called uh, the Van Wyck Expressway. Those of you who are familiar to New York know the Van Wyck Expressway is one of the ugliest, most pothole-filled, just just the kind of disaster that... Uh, that is the trip from Kennedy Airport into New York. And we were stuck there, uh, as usual, it was clogged with all kinds of traffic. And in the middle of the Van Wyck, um, I noticed something I always notice, which is the tram, which is a three or fill, um, a three or four billion dollar high speed railway, which goes all the way from Kennedy Airport about eight miles into Jamaica, Queens. There it stops. It doesn't go into uh, the central city the way you'd expect a high-speed rail from, you know, from any major city to even you know this city when it's working. It does that. So I sat there and I was thinking about that, and I was uh, thinking about you know just some other things, um, including the fact that um, at that time um, we were in the middle of the Republican primaries, and uh, Donald Trump seemed to be leading in the Republican primaries. And I thought about the other problems the country has. I turned to my wife and I said, um, what would a visitor to the United States think if, if they had just done what we did, which is land at Kennedy Airport? They'd never been to the United States before. Land at Kennedy Airport, trudge through the terminal, uh, get into a cab, get stuck on that highway, and see that tram and realize that no, they can't take that tram into the city because it doesn't go there. Um, What would they think of the greatest country in the world if that was their first impression? And then I started to think of some other stuff. I'd written a lot about healthcare, and I I just started tallying in my head a lot of the stuff that was wrong. Healthcare costs more in this country than any other country. The results are middling to poor. Our K-12 education system costs more per student than just about any country. Our results are in the middle uh, to poor. Uh, We haven't passed a comprehensive budget in this country since 1994. And I just started thinking about all that, and I decided that I was going to try to get uh, the answer. Again, how did this happen to us? So I decided to try a book that would attempt to answer the questions. And when I take on big reporting projects, it's it's usually out of sheer ignorance. I'm just curious about why something is. I don't really feel like an expert. And as I tried to find that answer over the last two plus years, um, I discovered a recurring irony. The core values that make America great about five decades ago 
had begun to bring America down. They became the often unintended instruments for splitting the country into two classes, the protected and the unprotected. The First Amendment, for example, we all love the First Amendment, journalists especially. Uh, the First Amendment became a tool for the wealthy to put a thumb on the scales of our democracy. Due process became an instrument to block all types of government activity meant to protect the unprotected, from enforcing job safety rules, to maintaining and building adequate mass transit and passable roads, to holding corporate criminals accountable. Reforms meant to enhance democracy undercut democracy by making low turnout and polarizing primaries the vehicle of choice for parties to choose their nominees. Classic American ingenuity brought not only life-changing technology and, turn, and was able to turn our economy often um, around and bring real progress, but the same kind of ingenuity in the form of, of, of a financial engineering turned our economy from an engine of long-term growth and shared prosperity into a casino with only a few big winners. And, as I'll explain, the most ironic of these boomerangs involve what is perhaps the most apple pie American value of all, uh, meritocracy. First, let's ask again, who are the unprotected that I just mentioned? Well, they're actually the 99% of our country who may be self-reliant and willing to work hard, but who rely on their government the way anyone relies on a government to work for the common good, to ensure a decent minimum wage, a fair tax system, and a democracy that gives them an equal voice. They rely on their country to provide a safe and fair workplace and the job training necessary to participate in a dynamic, in a dynamic um, economy that rightly welcomes technology and globalization. These, along with access to decent health care and to the public education that is the ticket to equal opportunity, are the common goods that any government is supposed to provide. But the unprotected can buy their own uncommon goods, private schools, squadrons of lawyers and lobbyists, the best tax planners. They don't need government, and often the government is a threat because it taxes them enforces labor or antitrust or securities laws against them, or otherwise tries to erect the necessary guardrails against conduct that hurts the common good. This book, at its core, explains that division, that large-scale abandonment of the common good, and explains how it happened. If you're a Democrat, it explains how we went to JFK, from, from JFK to Trump. If you're a Republican, it explains how we went from Eisenhower to, well, Trump. <laughs> In either case, it uncovers the people and the forces that hijack those core values in a way that negatively affects the lives of everyday people in this country. Now, I'm not going to try to recap the whole book. It's a pretty ambitious uh, thing that I've actually tried to pull off and it's not easy to boil down into an elevator pitch or even a bookstore pitch. But I will tease you with how two of those core values were turned against the common good, which suggests uh, many of the ironies and surprises that abound in the story of the tailspin. First, a scene in the book. One day last year, I spent the afternoon in a windowless room in a small building about a block from Capitol Hill. There, a member of Congress, a smart, decent, serious-minded person, just the kind of person you want to go into public service, uh, was sitting at a desk, and his staffer was handing him lists of people with their phone numbers. And he was sitting there making phone calls as fast as he could. On his desk was a lamp, and on the lamp was a post-it note in his handwriting saying, I don't give a 
expletive. The congressman was dialing donors, begging for money. Why the post-it note, I asked him. And he explained, when I'm in this room, I have to stay focused and I have to go fast. I can't give an expletive. And then he explained. He says, okay, here's an example. Um, I call this guy. I say, Bob, how are you? Oh, you're good. That's great. You know, it's really great to talk to you. You know, how's everything? Uh, you know, how's Elizabeth? Oh, she died? Ah, that's awful. She was such a wonderful person. I'm really sorry. But, you know, it's getting near the end of the quarter, and we have to file our financial report, and we really want to show that we raised a lot of money. So is there any way you could cut a check this afternoon for the maximum amount? Thanks. And, gee, we're going to miss Elizabeth. And he explained to me, look, he says, that's what I've become when I come into this room. That's who I am. He dials for dollars four to five hours a day every weekday. And he is typical. I picked him because he is typical. This is not exceptional. And every night, near the end of each quarter, he goes to fundraiser cocktail parties, taking checks from lobbyists who have organized the events and brought clients who want access to him. Now, when I spent one night doing that with him, I couldn't help but thinking that this could not be what the Founding Fathers had in mind uh, for Congress, or had in mind when they passed the First Amendment. So whose fault is this? Well, it turns out it's the work of a young man, now a prominent <coughs> law professor um, at Northwestern, who wanted to make his mark as a Harvard Law student in the early 1970s. His idea was to write a provocative paper arguing for the first time that corporations had the same First Amendment right to speak as people. It's also the fault of lawyers working for Ralph Nader, who seized on this guy's idea and convinced the Supreme Court in 1976 that corporations, in this case discount uh, pharmacies wanting to advertise their prices, had corporate First Amendment rights. How the First Amendment morphed into a weapon that corrupted the political system so completely and that now threatens to derail government regulations of corporate speech meant to protect consumers, including, ironically, the proper labeling of drugs, is the story of how special interests, the protected, were able to polarize and paralyze our country in order to dominate our government. Their dominance has been propelled by the shock troops of the new knowledge economy, lawyers and lobbyists. Which brings me to a second example of a core value that produced unintended consequences, the second example that I mentioned, uh, meritocracy. In 1964, I was a bookworm uh, junior high school student uh, growing up in Far Rockaway, a working class section of Queens in New York. One day I was out of school sick and I was reading through a biography of John Kennedy. You see, I said I was a bookworm, right? Um, and I read that he had gone to something called a prep school, um, and Choate was the name of the school. None of my teachers at junior high school 198 had a clue of what that meant, but I soon figured out that prep school was like college. You got to go to classes and live on a campus, only you got to go four years earlier, which seemed to me like a pretty good idea. Uh, the idea soon seemed even better because I discovered that some prep schools had started offering financial aid. I ended up at Deerfield in western Massachusetts where the headhunter told my worried parents who ran a perpetually struggling liquor store that his financial aid policy was that they should send him a check every year for whatever they thought they could afford. Four years later in 1967, I found myself uh, sitting in that headmaster's office one afternoon in the fall of my senior year at Deerfield. He had given it over to a man named R. Inslee Clark, the Dean of Admissions at Yale. Clark looked over my record, asked me a bunch of questions, uh, most of which oddly were about where I had grown up and how I had ended up at Deerfield. He seemed intrigued by the JFK, you know, Choate story. Um, then he paused, looked me in the eye, and asked if I really wanted to go to Yale if Yale was my first choice. When I said yes, his reply was instant. 
then I can promise you that you are in. I will tell the headmaster that you don't have to apply anywhere else. Just kind of keep it to yourself. So what I didn't know then was that I was part of a revolution being led by Clark, whose nickname was Inky. I was about to become one of, would come to be, uh, one of what would come to be known as Inky's boys and later girls. We were part of a meritocracy revolution that flourished at Yale and other elite education institutions, law firms, and investment banks in the mid-1960s and 1970s and beyond. It was a great thing for me and for so many other people, um, including uh, my wife, who became one of Inky's girls. But it turns out that it had a downside. At a Yale Law School graduation three years ago, a professor who had been chosen by the graduating class to be their speaker described the meritocracy revolution that Clark had ignited 48 years before. But then he bummed out his audience with this sobering message. Because elites could now spend what they needed to in order to send their children to the best schools, provide tutors for standardized testing, and otherwise ensure that their kids can outcompete their peers to secure the same spots at the top that their parents had achieved, economic diversity at elite schools was, was now, if anything, worse than it was three decades ago. He used lots of numbers to back that up, as do I in my book. Although it was once the engine of American social mobility, he said, meritocracy today has become precisely what it was invented to combat, a mechanism for the dynastic transmission of wealth and privilege across generations. Meritocracy, he, he, uh, he told the students, now constitutes a modern day aristocracy built for a world in which the greatest source of wealth is not land or factories, but human capital, the labor of skilled workers. These skilled workers, those who won the meritocracy race, became the knowledge worker generation. They were legal engineers inventing Tegner offers and corporate takeover fights. They were lawyers insisting on an absurdly expanded version of another great American value, due process to block regulations or turn them into decades long, yes, decades long drafting battles ending in thousands of pages of detail whose meaning could be debated through more due process whenever they were enforced. They blocked labor law enforcement and created arbitration clauses to keep everyday Americans out of court when they had consumer or employment discrimination claims. Now in the book, I confess to having had a role in boosting the lawyer meritocracy uh, by taking a lead in celebrating their success and their riches. In 1979, I started a magazine called The American Lawyer, which focused on the business of law firms. I thought of these firms as a really good ongoing business story. They were big, powerful businesses with intriguing questions lurking behind their uniformly elegant uh, reception areas. Which ones were the best managed? Which offered the most opportunity to minorities or women? Which were more likely to promote associates to partnership because they were economically healthy? Which had the fairest or most generous bonus systems for young associates? And yes, which had the most interesting clients and a client base that provided the highest profits per partner? That last question resulted in the American lawyer launching a special issue every summer beginning in 1985, in which we deployed reporters to pierce the secrecy of these private partnerships so that the magazine could rank the average profit taken home by partners at the largest firms. When the first survey was published, I received a call from a former Yale Law classmate of mine who practiced at a large Los Angeles firm. He was outraged because he and his wife had now found out that another classmate of ours who, pro, uh, who practiced at another seemingly fungible Los Angeles firm made about 25% more than he did. Until then, he had been perfectly happy with his six-figure income. Not anymore. 
sure, this new flow of market information about these businesses made those who ran them more accountable to their partners, their employees, and their clients, and much more eager to find places for people who had the most talent, regardless of their race, religion, or gender. But it also transformed the practice of law by the country's most talented lawyers in ways that had significant drawbacks. The emphasis was now fully on serving those clients who could pay the most with pro bono work, uh, professionalism, and collegiality often taking a back seat. And with the emphasis on talent, and this is really important, with the emphasis on talent, on recruiting those who had won the meritocracy race, rather than members of the old boys network, the big firms were now much fairer, but also much better able to serve and defend those clients. Others, including lots of lawyers, became uh, the financial engineers of the era at investment banks, spinning out trailblazing inventions meant to boost short-term gains in stocks, like stock buybacks, uh, derivatives, CDSs, mortgage-backed securities, while, while hollowing out the long-term economy on which the middle class depends. Breakthroughs in technology, another core American value, enabled automation and globalization, which added to the disruption of the economic security of the middle class. And it didn't have to be that way. In 1971, a young Nixon aide in the Nixon White House uh, named Peter Peterson, the Peter Peterson who went on to, uh, to found Blackstone, um, warned the Nixon cabinet and the president in a long memo that drastic improvements in job training and retraining programs were needed to enable that middle class to survive in what was to be this new automated globalized economy. He told me in an interview that we had uh, shortly before he passed away that he was ignored. Everybody said, you know, thanks for the memo, but nothing happened. The 50 year failure of the trade adjustment assistance job retraining program about which uh, Peterson uh, was writing, that was pushed originally by President Kennedy in 1962, was also ignored. Searching archives for the 55 years that followed, I found just two semi-substantive news articles anywhere in the press about how that program worked and didn't work. So, should the frustration of much of the country over how the winners in the meritocracy have played such a massive role in keeping government from delivering common goods really be a surprise? The frustrated, disillusioned Americans who voted for President Trump committed the ultimate act, if you think about it, of rejecting uh, the meritocrats, epitomized by the hardworking, always prepared, Wellesley and Yale Law educated but seemingly cold and calculating Hillary Clinton in favor of an inexperienced, never prepared, six-time bankrupted, vulgar, shoot-from-the-hip heir to a middling real estate fortune. And as I said, lots of other people and forces are part of this same unhappy, slow-motion, 50-year story, but I think that rejection of the meritocracy is... is in many ways, um, the key to the whole book. Um, so that, to me, is um, what we need to focus on, is how uh, the frustration really welled up with people who were rejecting everything that a lot of us in this room, for, all, for, good, for good reasons and for good motives, worked very hard to achieve. Now, so that's the story of the tailspin. But having said all that, I also have to say that I saw something else, too. In fact, this is a shockingly hopeful book. In every area that America has fallen, I saw people who were working and working effectively to reverse the fall. I saw a young Iraqi war vet and Harvard grad who had created a program at a converted zipper factory in Queens the trains waitresses, bar bouncers, and sales clerks to become software coders. 
They join the program, which is free, with average incomes of $18,000 and are placed 11 months later into jobs averaging $85,000. And this guy has even figured out a way to make the program self-sustaining and scalable. I discovered that the Aspen Institute has a project in New York that has recruited a growing group of business leaders to fight corporate short-termism. I watched two groups in New York, Open Secrets and Issue One, work to stir up enormous public disgust with how money has come to dominate politics and work also to channel it into a growing movement for real reform. I watched a group uh, called Better Markets, whose, whose leader is here today, um, create a real effective, substantive uh, pain in the neck for Wall Street lobby that is lobbying the, the other side of, uh, for example, the tearing down of Dodd-Frank. Um, I saw how leaders of, of uh, Baruch College in Manhattan and Amherst College in Massachusetts have put Yale and Harvard to shame when it comes to achieving real economic uh, diversity. Others, such as the Bipartisan Policy Center and the Partnership for Public Service here in Washington, have created blueprints for real solutions to our problems and real ways to change the way that government operates. I discovered that Peter Edelman, who is America's leading anti-poverty policy thinker, again here in Washington, has put together a detailed blueprint for uniting the cause of the poor with that of the working class by creating an entirely new employment infrastructure for this country. His idea, create millions of good paying jobs while serving a looming demographic crisis by hiring and training well paid elder caregivers and preschooled child care educators. Now, I know what your reaction is because it was mine too. Uh, you know, these people are just whistling in the wind. Why are they doing this? Everything is galloping in the opposite direction. Um, and I thought that until I looked at their resumes, and more important, until I poured through their work. Um, and I also asked them, and every one of these people I approached, um, at some point I would say to them, because they're, they're intensely smart, uh, intensely ambitious, high-achieving people. And I'd say, why are you doing this? You're just banging your head against the wall. Campaign finance reform? Or, you know, trying to track the donations given to some congressman who might be sitting on a committee when, I mean, they, you know, we have a much lower bar than that now. Um, why are you worried about that? And they all surprised me with their intensity and uh, their resilience. Um, and that stems from, from really sort of reading into their work and just digging into it and seeing that these people are doing the real thing. Um, not because they're gluttons for, for frustration, but because they believe that America can be put back on the right course. And I think they're right. I think when Americans realize that someone who used their frustration to scam them is not the answer, they will turn to leaders who are prepared intelligent, sincere, and able to unite them rather than play them. I believe that these new achievers who are fighting the tailspin on all fronts are laying the groundwork for disgust to be channeled into a restoration. In 2018, these people that I met and that I'm happy to profile in the book um, give new meaning to the word uh, uh, resilience. And they make me believe in our country's uh, strength and in its resilience. There's nothing wrong with the core values that brought the tailspin. They just need to be redirected back to the common good. And that, at the end of the day and at the end of the last page, is the message that I hope the book conveys. Thank you. So I'd be glad to take questions. Do you think there's any real prospect of campaign finance reform? Uh, is there any significant movement in that direction? And if so, where's it coming from? 
it would be hard to make the you know the objective argument you know okay look at this and look at this this is going to happen but um, a guy uh, uh, the guy who runs uh, one of the groups I profile uh, uh, the issue one group um, he said I said you know why do you think you know what are you doing why look look around you why do you think there's going to be you know campaign finance reform and he said his anal uh, his analogy was that it's like you know an alcoholic whose liver finally rejects the last drink. That there are now so many politicians, uh, incumbent politicians and also former politicians, who are so disgusted by that five hour a day exercise that this guy goes through, and so many people who are repulsed that at a certain point something is going to snap. Now, it's even harder than that because I happen to think that what you need is. Uh, uh, what you need is a constitutional amendment. I think that um, in, in, a, in a narrow way, not the way it, in, it ended up being you know, written, but in a narrow way that Citizens United was decided uh, consistent with the Constitution. So I don't think that's the route. I do think that a constitutional amendment actually may end up being more realistic in two or three or five years than we think. I think the level of public disgust, the public polling on this issue, uh, you know, Republicans, you know, something like 80% of the Republicans in Iowa, you know, favored a rollback of Citizens United in part because they have no idea what Citizens United actually is. But it, it's sort of, you know, synonymous with the notion of we need to do something about money in politics. Hi, Steve. Um Thank you so much for your great work. Um, and uh, your work on um, healthcare inspired my book, Mental Health Incorporated. So thank you so much thank for your you. reporting. I wanted to ask you, in terms of the politics of the good things that are happening, how can that occur amid all the polarization in our politics today? And there is a debate among progressives, should they push for impeachment or not as a central theme for the 2018 elections? But how do you see the good things being pushed forward in a climate of such extreme polar polarization and uh, the dominance I of money. I think it's up to the right leaders to come forward, and I think everybody, you know, the people, have to get better at uh, democracy. But it's not, you know, if you look at this you know, really objectively, the idea that in 2016, or any other year for that matter, but certainly in 2016, that someone could win or almost win the popular vote by uh, convincing um, large numbers of middle class people that it was the poor people who were threatening them, that, that, that it's immigrants who were threatening them, and it's you know, the food stamp program and the CHIP program that, and, uh, and the Affordable Care Act that are threatening them is hard to believe because um, what we need are political leaders you know, like a Robert Kennedy way back when who can convince people that the poor and the middle class have much, much, much more in common. In fact, more in common arguably today than ever because the middle class are becoming so poor. You know, you know programs like food stamps, that's a middle class program. You know, the, the, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was, uh, was, you know, written to protect the middle class, you know, payday lenders fleece the middle class, people who have jobs and, you know, are waiting for their paydays. Okay. I'm, I'm not, uh, thank you so much. I'm not asking for you to endorse anyone. Is there any leaders on the horizon who you think fit that bill? <laughs> I'm not, that's not, I'm not in that business. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, you're probably familiar with the article that um, Matthew uh, Stewart uh, has in the Atlantic this I'm month. familiar with it, but I would be lying to you if I told you I was able to read the whole thing. Okay. Um, well, he makes a uh, general argument very similar to the to the one that you're making. Well, but not real. I, mm -hmm. you know, Time Magazine had to do an excerpt. They did a fabulous excerpt, but they took you know four thousand of one hundred and twenty eight thousand words, and and you could walk away with the impression that that and that alone is the theme of the book. And it's not right. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not being critical. I, no, I just I, wanted I, to get at one uh, one particular critical. point that sure. he makes. Um, he also divides the 
the nation up into the meritocratic aristocracy, uh -huh. as you do. Uh, but he makes the cut at a rather different place, at uh, I think 10% rather than the 1%. And um, sort of makes the case that, um, that that's a really important thing, that this much larger number of Americans, millions and millions, that fit in that upper, upper 10%, which includes, I suspect, a very large fraction of the people here in this room, and much larger than the fraction that's in the upper 1%. I think his point is that um, we're, Many of us are part of this upper uh, aristocratic meritocracy. Well, I think that's right. I, I, and I uh, that, that we it. all have responsibilities. It isn't just the, uh, the fat cats, so to speak. And that it may be more passive in some ways, our role in, the, in perpetuating the lack of social mobility up the classes. But, um, I think that's probably right. I think I agree with that. I think, you know, if, if you, if you're a two hundred thousand dollar year associate at a law firm, um, you're certainly in the top ten percent. You're probably even a little, you know, well beyond that. And if you're the woman or the guy, right, uh, uh, you know, writing the argument that says, you know, you work for the Munger Tolls Law Firm and you wrote uh, the argument that says that uh, the customers of Wells Fargo who had their uh, their credit ratings right. get ruined and were cheated because the bank opened extra accounts for them, but that that should go to mandatory arbitration because when they signed up for their original account, it said, you hereby agree to arbitration for anything ever to have to do right. with your relationship with Wells Fargo. If you're that, that associate doing that, uh, you're not in the top 1%, but you know, as far as I'm concerned, you probably ought to be thinking about you know, doing some other stuff in your life? Uh, thank you. Hello. Um, I come here often, and um, there are a lot of books out now about how bad things are and all the problems. And I'm glad to see you suggest you know some things that are positive, because that is very important. But I don't know if we're really grasping how serious and how deep and fundamental this problem is right now. Because it's, it's to some degree, human nature to want to covet things and get for themselves and their children and so forth. That's, that's, that's exactly incredible. right. But I'm not sure we're grasping the institutional problems that are structurally interfering with any possibility of really getting a true reform. I mean, even the Constitution itself. With, all, with all due respect, I pray that you read the book because I think you'll see that's, that's exactly where I try to go. And, and I think it's why the book is catching on. It goes past the, you know, that, you know, the stupid day-to-day -day headlines of what's happening in the administration and, and goes to those core issues. I mean, the issue you raised um, a minute ago, it is obviously the new meritocracy, it, it, it is totally you know, difficult, and, and in my case, hypocritical, to say that there's something wrong with parents who do well and then want to do whatever they possibly can to make sure their kids do well. That's an that's a unnatural act to, to do the opposite. So that's a pretty hardcore problem. It is. And institutionally, too. Yeah. Institute in terms of higher education institutions, but that's why I tell the story of where Amherst and Vassar and now even Princeton, I'm surprised to say, um, are doing to really address that. It's pretty interesting. Thank you. So I was heartened to hear that you have hope um, and that you've focused on some individuals who are doing extraordinary things. But I wondered if you could also, if you find hope in what is happening in terms of collective action, the teacher strikes, the women's march, the gun march, the way that Absolutely. people are in action at the grassroots That's level. what I mean by the notion that things are going to get so bad that they get good. Um, and, and the reason I focus on leaders like uh, you know, my friend over here who runs uh, the Better Markets Group is that when 
as more people start to focus on that stuff, they'll have organizations to go to and leaders who can help lead and they'll have real hardcore good information that they can use. And that's in most of the spheres that I talk about. The, there are these, these people who are just, you know, they're too dumb to realize that, the, that their work, you know, is impossible because it's not impossible. It, I feel like it's almost a case of pegging off uh, the last questioner. The fault, dear Brutus, lies not in the stars, but in ourselves. How do we get a better informed electorate so they understand what the leaders are actually trying to tell them? So they'll know how to judge the qualifications of leaders and they'll understand what it takes to run a government that can really help them be the best people they can be, let alone just getting to the polls to vote. Well, that you know, the last part's a pretty big part. Um, you know, that, that is always the challenge of a democracy, right? You, you know, it's the, it's the least bad way to do government. Um, but it can get pretty bad if, it, if the people aren't informed and if they don't care. We have a bunch of new problems in that regard um, with technology and fake news. I've just started a business that is, that is trying to deal with the fake news problem. Um, but it's that, but it's deeper than that. But I'm not that, you know, upset about that or, or depressed. I mean, if 70,000 votes scattered in three states had gone the other way, uh, we'd be here talking about my book. I don't think my book would be terribly different, but we'd be, uh, we'd be talking about what do we do about the fact that our government is so paralyzed and, you know, uh, uh, the incumbent uh, Democratic president can't get anything done. But it's still only half the voting population. Why don't people in this country, which invented voting for representative government, show up? Listen, I always favored a law, and I don't even think it needs to be a constitutional amendment. In fact, I'm pretty sure it doesn't because elections are voted by state or are, are, are controlled by the states. I always like the idea of a, you know, of a state saying, um, uh, if you don't vote, uh, we're going to tax you uh, X percent of your income, and the Republicans couldn't be against that because it would provide much more incentive for rich people to vote than poor people to vote. But of course, rich people already do vote. Thank you. Thank you for presenting. Um, I was wondering if you could touch upon government's collusion with big banks and the student loan debt crisis, and do you see a positive trend with that? I don't know enough about the current events uh, surrounding that. To, to give you a really intelligent answer, but I do know um, what's happened with big banks, and I am totally amused to realize that, uh, to, to watch as we try to peel back uh, Dodd-Frank and the Volcker law, because, you know, as you know, in 2010, the big, ba uh, the big bank said, if this rule happens, if this stuff goes into effect, our businesses are going to be destroyed, um, and it's going to be terrible for us. They have continued to have record profits. I mean, their profits just dwarf what they were the day the law was passed. They have record market share. So the notion that, you know, the vocal rule is just going to cut into their markets and cut into what is the problem we just tried to solve? The only thing we did was we invited the problem that we did try to solve, and not very well, in 2010 when we passed Dodd-Frank. Should I do that okay, Dennis? I was real good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. ask Dennis. He'll, he'll tell you. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Um, so you mentioned uh, like the 2016 election kind of as a rejection of like meritocracy. Would you say that rejection is more drawn from like cultural anxiety or straight up like? Well, first of all, it's a 46% rejection. Let's keep it in perspective. And second, I, you know, anyone who generalizes about why everybody voted or for that matter why everybody did anything is making a mistake. But I do think that the two, the two characters, the two opponents, you know, epitomized the opposite poles. And what I say in the book is um, 
there's a passage in the book uh, where I quote President Obama as you know saying you know, he continually thought uh, the polarization fever would break. His words: We're going to break the fever after after the 2010 election. The fever will break, and the Republicans will start working with the Democrats again after 2012. The fever will break after 2014. Um, well, in 2016, the the fever did break. People were so so frustrated that they basically said, you know, we just hate all these people. Let's just take this guy who's not a who's not among any of them. And I think to to steal Obama's metaphor that uh, Trump and what's going on now is going to break the fever in the right direction if the right leaders come forward. People who, you know, can connect with people who have real policies and who aren't afraid to try to unite uh, the middle class with the poor. Um, you know, it's gotten so bad, excuse me, the, the, you know, it's actually gotten so bad that even the, the most liberal politicians, almost all of even the most liberal politicians never talk about poor people anymore because they're afraid that the middle class will be so angry at them if they do. Um, I, I've been interested in your talk. I, I think it's really good. And, I, and you've talked about, you know, equal opportunity and the meritocracy. But it seems to me that all that leaves way too many people behind. And most people aren't going to Yale and Harvard and Stanford, where I went and you went. And uh, uh, what do they do? What, what have you seen some hope? for them, because those are the people that Trump's talking about. And they're not going to go to Harvard, and they're not going to go to all these places, and they're not going to work for fancy law firms. They, hardly, they don't read books. Uh, and that's a huge, huge number of people in this country. Well, two thoughts what happens, about that. What happens to them? Well, two I mean, thoughts about that. I spend more time in the book uh, talking about uh, Baruch College in Manhattan, which is certainly not an elite institution, but it continues a tradition of state and local funded uh, you know, schools, including uh, community colleges and universities that have always provided an engine to get people into the middle class. And of course, uh, the cutbacks at state universities and community college are, you know, I spent a lot of time talking about that. That's outrageous. So yeah, we, uh, you know, the country doesn't work if, you know, if the exceptional people are, you know, treated like they're exceptional, and it doesn't work if we sort of mix up the demographics of the very people at the top. It, but it is emblematic that we that we've kind of screwed up the demographics of people at the top. The other thing I would say is that um, the the reporting I did that that kind of infuriated me the most and, and surprised me the most was the difference in this country. Uh, versus every other country when it comes to job training and retraining people. Um, for most other countries, that is seen to like the same obligation as K-12 to education. In Germany, 60% of young people are in uh, apprenticeship programs. In this country, it's 5%, and needless to say, you know, the White House is cutting it back. Um, and, and the 5% don't really work either. No one pays that much attention to them. So that's what you have to do. And uh, that, pro you know, that issue kind of solved itself after the war because you know, everybody needed consumer products and you know, the factories were humming. But what Tailspin really is is the story of what happened to those people, how they were just ignored after the war, ignored uh, uh, when automation and globalization took their jobs away and ignored when we became a knowledge economy, and there's no reason they can't be part of the knowledge economy, as witnessed by the fact that uh, you know software coders are part of the knowledge economy, and uh, this guy in Queens is proving that you can take people without a high school education, who have aptitude and are smart, they've just never had a chance, and you can get them into, in his case, $85,000 a year jobs, quickly. It can be done. 
I wonder if I'd like to uh, ask if there, if you in the book or right now you'd care to talk about uh, some of the changes in the rhetoric and the media that have happened since in this period that you're talking about, because there was a time in this country when the working class and the poor people voted Democratic, from certainly from the New Deal through the Great Society, and that's changed. They felt the government was on their side, and so either through spin or careful rhetoric or something, uh, a little bit fake news lately, that's changed. The government is the enemy and are in, in their minds, and I wonder if you would talk a little well, bit let, about that. Okay, let me give you an example. I mean, I, I think you're right about rhetoric and spin and all that stuff, but uh, let's be a little more tangible. Um, Henry County, Virginia, um, there were furniture factories there. Um, the trade adjustment assistance program was supposed to work there. A fabulous journalist uh, named Beth Macy wrote a book about the struggles of a furniture factory there and that community um, after China was admitted to the WTO. Okay, in 1960, Kennedy won Henry County, Virginia. I think I'm getting this right because I looked at it this morning, but I may screw it up by a few uh, points. I think 63 to 37. In 2016, Trump won Henry County, Virginia by 63 to 37. Those people were left behind. The Democratic Party has done nothing for them. They had a program that didn't work. It didn't work under Republicans, didn't work under Democrats. Um, the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program, which was passed in 1962, it took three years before any company was allowed to have its workers, its displaced workers, even participate in the benefits. Because you had to prove that you were 100% displaced by globalization. So if there was some competition, and you know, and the bureaucrats just kept everybody at the program, it really gets me angry because all of us in the press, until Beth Macy came along, like you know, two years ago or three years ago, ignored this thing. It really ignored it, and, and, and the, the core of the country was hollowed out by stuff like that. So, yeah, it's rhetoric, it's you know, it's Trump, but it's more a question of politicians using the fact that people have been ignored and been bereft of their opportunity are much more susceptible to rhetoric that says, well, you know, if we build a wall, you won't have all these immigrants taking your jobs away. Uh, you know, people step in and take advantage of that kind of discontent. In your interviews. Sorry. We have time for these last two questions. Okay. <laughs> I'm in. In, in your interviews with uh, various people, what was their opinion about the potential role of young people since we're seeing them, several examples of their leadership focusing on the common interest? Well, most of my interviews happened um, before, you know, well before you know, Parkland. Parkland happened when the book was going to press. Um, but I would say as a general matter, what, what I would find, uh, for example, in talking to Kids, I, I remember I, I talked to a half a dozen or, um, or a dozen kids who were graduating from uh, Baruch College, all of whom came from really poor families, and they were getting internships at accounting firms and investment banks, and that was good. But they, they really didn't think the government was going to help them with anything. Um, but I really didn't probe that deeply in terms of uh, you know generations. I will tell you that. Um, you know, when you write a book, you really become, you know, kind of, you know, shameless about certain things, including looking on Amazon all the time. Um, and so I read, I think, the first, maybe the first and only review so far on Amazon, or maybe there are four, but, but the first review, you know, was very complimentary to the book, and then said, the last sentence was something like, Brill demonstrates how the millennials have been left the scraps of a dying country. Or something like that. It's just really brutal. But he gave it four or five stars, whatever the rating. So he's obviously brilliant. But um, <laughs> so I really don't have a great answer to your question. But I think there's a lot of cynicism. That you know, it certainly isn't. You know, me sitting there and reading a bio of JFK and saying, "My God, you know, you know, we got to get back the new frontier." Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess I am last. Thank you for a terrific presentation, but I want to push back a little bit. 
if uh -oh. I can, with three quick points. You're I talk knew we should have cut off the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, I'm going to avoid uh, uh, defending my law school uh, 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 professor at Northwestern and go on to uh, other points. Um, He's a terrific guy, by the way. I really like him. You want to share a name? Uh, Marty Reddish. He is a great, he's a he's, brilliant he's fellow. He's a great human being. He is. Just uh, totally wrong about him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get into, let's get into totally wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, you mentioned the Trade Adjustment Assistance Act. Uh -huh. um, and I think people here would get the impression that that was the only manpower or retraining program around. It's not. It was a very small piece of Jack Kennedy's much broader program, which included the Manpower, manpower Development and Training Act, the Area Readjustment Act, and, and the, pro, and the Tr Trade Adjustment Assistance Act uh, had a very difficult job, which was to determine whether or not someone actually lost their job because of, of, a tr of the Kennedy round, basically. Right. But they could get job training in West Virginia or elsewhere under the others. You talk about 50 Is years. Is this where I get to ask what's the question? Uh, well, it's, it's, a, it's a comment, <laughs> okay. which is that I think that, um, uh, that there's a, been a, a lot of uh, government money for, for job training over many years. The second point... Oh, oh no, let me... Totally. There's been a lot of government money for job training all poured down the drain. None of it worked. The GAO, or what was... Uh, uh, the government accounting office that became the government accountability yeah. office, they actually for a while stopped doing reports about how terrible the programs were because they just kept writing the same report through Democratic administrations and Republican. And, and I read every one of them. Uh, well, we could have a difference of view the as manpower, to whether they work you know, or not. The Manpower Act, all of those programs. I just decided to mention to Well, you they all had, okay. Um, we'll disagree on Which that. ones did you work in? I helped write the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, which, ah, was, con which bingo. was conceptualized by George <laughs> Schultz and Pat Moynihan, and did work a whole lot, and provided public jobs for lots of people. But the, uh, uh, you talk about the electorate. Well, the electorate didn't put Donald Trump in the White House. If it was up to the electorate, Hillary Clinton would have been in the White House. And she beat Donald Trump by more votes than Kennedy beat Nixon, or Nixon beat Humphrey, or Carter beat Ford, or President uh, Gore beat uh, Governor Bush. And so there are, a lot of things, there are a lot of things wrong, but I wouldn't blame it on the electorate. The last point is uh, James McGregor Burns wrote the famous book, The Deadlock of Democracy, and I think what we're living with is a, the attack on democracy. And if the, if the people were fairly represented in Congress, if the Electoral College wasn't around, we would get a lot more of what you're advocating and what I would advocate done because the public will would be reflected in our public institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>